<laughs> okay, we are ready to start. Today is November 5th already. Um, my name is Crystal Morris. Uh, welcome to the UVC uh, Learning Circle. And today we are here um, for Healthy Eating in Pregnancy and Early Childhood with Jerry Kasten. Um, thank you for all your patience. Last week we did have a, a few minor technical glitches in our equipment and services. So today I'm pretty sure everything is up and running. Thank you um, to our technical support and the hard work that they have done. Um, I will introduce Jerry now and turn the table over to Jerry. Literally turn the table over to you. <laughs> Jerry Kasten is a registered dietitian um, with the First Nations Health Authority. Um, he will be reviewing the latest recommendations for infant feeding, but with an eye to the practical. Choosing foods for mom while she's pregnant and some suggestions for those times when she may be not feeling her best. So Jerry has worked with food all of his life. He was born to a farming family and still helps his brother bring in the harvest each year. He has received his honors diploma in commercial cooking and bachelor's and master's degree in nutrition. He has worked in public health in British Columbia for the past 22 years, and he is also a sessional instructor in UBC's dietics program. He is currently the co-chair of Health Canada's Infant Feeding Expert Advisory Group. He wants to live in a world where people celebrate food sharing it with those they love, taking its pleasure without restraint because its flavor saturates their most sensuous appetites. I am actually really excited to have Jerry back <laughs> on the UBC Learning Circle. So what I'm going to do is just turn it right over to him because we're just running a few minutes behind. And again, thank you. Um, welcome, Jerry. Thanks so much. So we should get started because, as you said, we're running a couple minutes behind. So I'm going to skip over my first slide, which is... Uh, just what Crystal just told you, that I'm a registered dietitian and that I've been working for 23 years in public health, that I've worked for the First Nations Health Authority for three years now, well, since October 1st, since First Nations Health Authority became an entity. And so I've worked in First Nations Health. And then I also work in a variety of other settings, like as a primary care dietitian in the doctor's office, work with my brother on the farm, I worked as a chef, uh, and my master's degree, and, and they mentioned about the chair of the expert advisory panel on infant nutrition. So I like to start my presentations by giving people something to think about, because every nutrition presentation, of course, talks about nutrition. But there's some other things to keep in mind in the greater picture. And so one of those things is that our personal health practices, the amount of... Uh, activity we get, the nutrition that we do, those personal health practices come seventh in the things that make us healthy. And you'll notice that income and social status make us, are uh, they're the things that make us the most healthy. So sadly, uh, how much money you make is a key determinant of your health status. And then a lot of the other things that come between two and six are things that contribute to your income, things like your social support networks, your education, your literacy, your employment and working conditions, and then social environments and even physical environments like the house you live in. All of those have a greater impact than the things than the personal health practices that you do. What you doing, Crystal? Keep freezing. <laughs> oh, she says we keep freezing. So uh, my apologies. Uh, we'll just, just try to move along. And so BC has also had the highest rate of child poverty in Canada for six years running. And 96,000 people used food banks in March 2012 with 28,000 children. So this is something that's going up. So then when we think about the determinants of health, oh, someone's come unmuted. When we think about the determinants of health, it's a huge impact that people don't have enough food. Uh, so you can find out about hunger because, like everything else, there is an app for that. So the hunger count, uh, you can put your iPhone up to the screen and take a picture of this QA. QSR code and <laughs> download the Hunger Count app. 
So I also want to just take a very brief run through of things that are good nutrition practices generally. So some of those things are menu planning. People think that a lot goes into menu planning, but actually it's a fairly simple task that when people menu plan, they're more likely to meet the recommendations of the food guide, more likely to shop for food, they have lower food costs, and they're less likely to consume higher fat foods. And so this is a great picture of a menu plan. All you need to do really is write down five things that you know how to make, right? And then beside them, you can just write Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And you can also assign tasks to different people. So the great thing about menu planning is it takes away the what should we have for supper tonight? And uh, the default, if you're pushed or if you're hurried, tends to be to get takeout food or to eat something that's very, very fast. And so by doing some menu planning and some shopping, that makes an enormous difference. And that's why we have shopping lists as the next key sound nutrition practice. Once you've done your menu planning, you can make a shopping list. You can check the cupboards, see what you have, see what you don't have, make a shopping list, and go to the store because going uh, to the store makes a big difference. Eating breakfast just means, once again, that people are more likely to meet Canada's Food Guide recommendations. The good news is that almost 75% of us actually do eat breakfast. And people who eat breakfast also eat less food throughout the day and, of course, have better work performance. The other thing that makes a big difference to nutrition is people who eat together. That People who eat together eat more fruits and vegetables, they eat lower fat meals, and kids in families who eat together choose less fried foods and soft drinks when they're away from home. So people are generally more likely to meet recommendations for vitamins and minerals. We know that it's very, very positive for families to eat together, and it doesn't have to be supper. It really, all of the studies that have been done show that people who eat one meal together per day get all of these benefits. Now there's a fantastic website, the bettertogetherbc.ca, and this is a picture of the homepage. So bettertogetherbc.ca has all kinds of tools, the menu planning tool that I showed you, and there's grocery lists, there's recipes, there's video recipes, so it's all there under learning and under kid-friendly kid recipes. So there's a fantastic array of resources at the bettertogetherbc.ca website. And so how does one choose food? Really, it comes back to Canada's Food Guide and Canada's Food Guide for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. And one of the things that I like about the Food Guide for First Nations is that the outer circle shows store foods, but the inner circle shows traditionally gathered foods. Now, of course, this is from all across Canada, because I know that we don't gather a lot of buffalo here, <laughs> but uh, there are uh, people gathering salmon and smoking, and so there's a wide variety of foods depicted, and so it recognizes the critical nature of traditional foods in First Nations diets. The, Food Guide came about in the 1940s, and the, you can see that back then they were called Canada's Food Rules. This is because they came about during the war, and they're a way to show people that even with rationing, they could still meet all of their nutrition needs. You can see that it's been updated about every 20 years or so since then, and our latest update was in 2007. And. Uh, the food guide gives us amounts of food to eat, and this is the number of food guide servings per day. What I find often is that people are a little bit confused about this, so I give them some really basic general advice, which is start eating when you're hungry and stop eating when you're full. You don't have to clean your plate. You don't have to have two more bites. You need to stop eating when your belly is full. And that is a really good guide. And we'll talk more about that later and the great gift you can give children by training them to eat when they're hungry and stop eating when they're full. 
Next, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes talking about ways we choose food, that the food guide tells us to enjoy a variety of foods from each group every day because variety is the cornerstone of good nutrition. And so the more different foods you eat, the more likely you are to be well nourished. We also have some general guidance at a number of places in the food guide to choose lower fat foods more often. Now, since the time the food guide was released, certainly choosing lower fat foods is always a great option. But one of the things we've learned is that often processed foods are more important to avoid than foods that are naturally higher in fat. Things like avocados and fish are good examples. So although uh, the food guide does recommend to choose lower fat foods more often, I really have started encouraging people to try to move away from processed foods in preference to avoidance of fat. So now vegetables and fruit are critical new critical provide critical nutrition for us and so they provide all kinds of things they provide antioxidants right and we have that in all of our onion compounds like onion and garlic and the allium compounds that we find in them right we also find it in anthocyanins right and so that's in a lot of our colors so uh, other foods like carotene other sorry other nutrients like carotene so this is why the food guide gives us the advice to choose dark green and orange vegetables and orange fruit more often and I build on that food guide advice by telling people to choose lots and lots of different colors and the more different colors you choose the better and the deeper and richer those colors are really makes an enormous difference when we're talking about grain products, what I really encourage people to choose is whole grain products. The food guide suggests choosing whole grain and enriched products, making whole grains at least half of the foods that you eat. I, again, go one step further and encourage people to choose actual whole unground grains. So things like colored rices and quinoa is very popular right now, but so are other grains like kamut and spelt and uh, things like amaranth. Uh, steel cut oats are another good example. Uh, corn and, and whole grain cornmeal. So there's lots of whole grain products. And those really make uh, uh, most of our fiber content and also gives us important nutrients like vitamin E. There's also the milk and milk alternates. So there's uh, the lower fat milk products like 2%, 1% and skimmed milks and skimmed canned milks, right? We have a variety of fortified milk alternatives like soy, but also other non-nutritionally equivalent ones like rice and potato. And so the soy is pretty much nutritionally equivalent to milk, but uh, the rice and potato and almond and coconut they don't have all of the nutrition that milk has. The other thing I really encourage people to eat are fermented milk products like yogurt and kefir and a variety of cheeses because those contain the bacteria that naturally contribute to making our intestines healthy, right? You hear a lot about probiotics and prebiotics these days. Well, these fermented products are great sources of those probiotics. And our meats and meat alternatives, well, again, choosing leaner meats. Now, a lot of meats that we um, hunt and harvest are very lean meats to start with. Moose, deer, rabbit, all of these foods are fantastic lean meats and also excellent sources of iron because uh, I'm often telling people that animals that have to run away to stay alive, they're great sources of iron. So if you want to bump up your iron, and we will be talking a lot about iron, I really encourage people to consume those meats, and particularly the meats that we hunt to harvest. Uh, poultry and fish are also great choices, and so are meat alternatives. And we'll talk a bit more about uh, dried peas and beans and lentils later on today. And so Canada's Food Guide also recommends satisfying your thirst with water. They kindly provided me a big jug of it here today. 
And uh, so when I was hiking in Death Valley, the lowest part of the North American continent, I found this wonderful sign in the bathroom hanging over the urinal. And I really like this because what it shows us is that our pee should be clear. If you want the very best indication that you're getting enough water to drink, then this, uh, it's really important to remember that your pee should be clear that it should have very, very little color. And that's a really good indication that you're getting enough water. And so, so much so that the National Park Service of the United States of America hangs these signs over the urinals in Death Valley. <laughs> Canada's Food Guide also recommends choosing some of these foods less often. And these are foods that are significant sources of calories and fat and sugar and salt, right? And so these are foods that people generally know are less healthy. Uh, what the Food Guide suggests is that examples of food and drinks to limit are, and you have to take a big breath here because it's a long list, right? You go, <gasps> Pop, fruit flavored drinks, sweet drinks made from crystals, sports and energy drinks, candy, chocolate, cakes, pastries, donuts, muffins, granola bars, cookies, ice cream, frozen desserts, potato chips, nachos, and other salty snacks, french fries, and alcohol. Right? <laughs> and the reason I put this list up is because when we looked at BC consumption in 1999, what we found was that over a quarter of the calories that we eat are coming from these other foods, from that list that I just read out. So we're eating an enormous amount of calories that aren't giving us very much nutrition. So I really encourage people to consider limiting those foods to overall cut our calories. Now there's lots of information about the food guide online. You just go to healthcanada.gc.ca. Right on the front page, you can click on the food guide. One of the things I've put up here is the link to my food guide. And that's a great resource because you just enter your sex and your age and it automatically generates how many servings you need. And then it gives you lists of food and you can pick which ones you wanna show on your food guide. So it's really, really pleasant way to make up a food guide that you can post on the fridge and actually uh, print it off. And you can actually print it off in another number of languages, including six First, Na six First Nations languages, none of which are originating in BC. <laughs> <laughs> we have too many languages here in BC. Yeah. <laughs> so Canada's Food Guide also recommends that for a strong body, mind, and spirit, we need to be active. We need to take joy in moving our bodies. And so we have Canada's physical activity guidelines, and on here are links to the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiologists. And they are the folks who developed Canada's physical activity guidelines that recommend that we get 150 minutes per week of physical activity. They've also produced physical activity guidelines for children aged 0 to 4 and for children aged 5 to 11. So there's a variety of physical activity guidelines, and there's also sedentary behavior guidelines, right? So it tells us that we shouldn't be sitting outside of work for more than two hours per day. And so it gives us some really good guidelines about how much we should be sedentary. So we have both physical activity and sedentary behavior guidelines. So really, it's important that people enjoy eating well, being active, and feeling good about yourself. And this is the message that makes me proud to be a Canadian. Because all food guides everywhere tell you to eat well. And most of the food guides across the world tell you that you should be active. But Canada's was the first food guide that included a self-esteem component that tells us that we should feel good about being who we are. So, this part just makes me proud to be Canadian. <laughs> and so, to the 
subject of today's conversation. And so that's babies, boobies, bottles, and by cost. So we have <laughs> babies first. And this is the advice that Canada's Food Guide gives for pregnant and breastfeeding women, that they need to include an extra two to three food guide servings from any of the food Hi, groups. Right? Hi, Gary. So that's Jerry. an extra glass of milk and an extra slice of bread. I just wanted right? to let you know my, that your screen is uh, frozen My coworker, on Suzanne, side gives a uh, great guidance. She says, you need to eat twice as healthy, not twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. So we actually have a guide for weight gain during pregnancy. And this is at the Health Canada website. Uh, uh, again, in the PDF, you can click on this healthy weight gain during pregnancy, and that will take you directly to Health Canada's website. Your screen Same is thing frozen again. with the weight gain calculator that uh, you can click the weight gain calculator and it will take you right to the calculator on the website. And what it produces is a guide to how weight gain can occur for people of any body weight. So it generates a graph like this that shows you generally how much weight gain, how much weight people should gain. Now, I view this in a slightly critical light because, uh, you know, I read this article. You can see it's called Ills from the Womb, a Critical Examination of Clinical Guidelines for Obesity and Pregnancy, right? So I read it and, ooh, that's pretty scary. Ills from the Womb, right? And so this started my journey um, critically analyzing this, right? Because this was written by a couple of professors in gender studies, one of which is from Jeremy? the University of Saskatchewan. So I thought to myself, Sorry. I thought, oh, Jerry. those feminists just <laughs> stirring up trouble again, <laughs> right? Jerry. And so Jerry. what they talked Jerry. about is they talk about <laughs> these, the uh, Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada produced guidelines for weight gain during pregnancy. And here they are. They give this guidance about pregnancy weight gain based on body mass index. And it tells people how much weight they should gain over their pregnancy based on their pre-pregnancy body mass index. So, you know, the Society of Obstetricians, they just didn't they didn't just pull these out of the air. They actually referenced them to Williams Obstetrics, 21st edition, right? So I went to Williams Obstetrics, 21st edition, and they do indeed have exactly those recommendations. And they're based on the recommendations of the Institutes of Medicine, right? And so they referenced it to this nutrition during pregnancy on weight gain and nutrient supplements from 1990. And so I went and looked that up. There it is, nutrition during pregnancy, weight gain and nutrient supplements. Except for one little thing that since 1990, they actually revised this in 2009, which is actually one year before the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada made their recommendations. <laughs> so interestingly, they recommended that people whose BMIs are over 30 uh, can gain 11 to 20 pounds or 5 to 9 kilos, as opposed to the recommendation included in the Society of Obstetrician and Gynecologists of Canada, which recommended 7 pounds. So it's interesting that the recommendations changed and yet that recommendation wasn't revised. And so I thought, well, so what do we do about weight gain during pregnancy? And I thought, well, I'll just go to the Cochrane people. Because those Cochrane people, they know everything. They spend loads of money generating these Cochrane reviews. And so they generated a Cochrane review on interventions for preventing excessive weight gain during pregnancy. And I thought, well, those Cochrane people, they're very smart. <laughs> what are they telling us? In fact, what they tell us is there is not enough evidence to recommend any intervention for preventing excessive weight gain during pregnancy. So that was in January of 2012. Cochrane Reviews, those smarty smart, smart, smarty smart, smart people told us, well, what we found is actually there's no evidence that anything works. <laughs> and so some other clever people in, I think, uh, May 2012 said, well, 
we don't quite believe those Cochrane people. So we, they just looked at, you know, some interventions. We're going to look at a bunch more. And so what they found was that the provision of regular input on planned nutritional intake has the potential to improve outcomes. In other words, if we talk to women about the food that they're going to eat, well, then we get improved outcomes, right? They say that current research focuses mainly on mixed interventions with both diet and physical activity components, but that interventions predominantly based on diet seem to be more effective for weight-related outcomes. So I translate this to mean that what you eat actually impacts your weight. <laughs> so, you know, they're smart people, but what they went on to say was that with a lack of individual data on important factors such as age, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, compliance, and other risk factors, we are limited in our explanation for the benefits observed with diet compared with other methods. So once again, where there's a recognition that impacts other than personal health behaviors have a more dramatic impact on weight than our own health behaviors. And so that was in 2012, like I say, I think it was slightly after the Cochrane Reviews. And so then I went to this study, right, which checked a variety of approaches. And what it did was it looked at social determinants of health. And look what they found. The understanding that low social determinants of health is not only independently associated with adverse outcomes, but also the simultaneous occurrence suggests that greater health gains, and that's my emphasis, may be achieved if investments focus on reducing the social inequities behind health disparities rather than tacking proximate risk factors. In other words, if we pay attention to the social determinants of health, rather than lecturing women about the foods that they're eating, then we have better outcomes. And that also is from 2012, I believe June. And so then I think about what is our CPNP? What do they tell us, right? Our Canada Prenatal Nutrition Program. It tells us that we need to talk to women about the foods they eat, do nutrition screening, education, and counseling. Talking to women about the foods they eat. We need to give them food. We need to provide maternal nourishment. And we need to promote and support breastfeeding, right? And that we can also spend money on activities that support those three key outcomes. So. The Canada Prenatal Nutrition Program talks to women about food, just like that review said we should do, and it works to enhance the social determinants of health by providing food and also by promoting breastfeeding. It's also critically important that this is cultural, culturally grounded and provides links to other services. So this review that I did on um, what actually impacts the health of pregnant women really told me that with the Canada Prenatal Nutrition Program, we're doing an excellent job of doing what we're supposed to be doing. And certainly the evaluations of the program show that all of the outcomes for those women who participate in the program and for their babies are all improved. So I guess we can... I'm going to hurt myself from patting myself on the back so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and so at the end of it all, what I've included here in the PDF is if you click on the article itself, what you'll get is an online version of the article. And if you have problems with the clicking, well, then I've provided the actual address of the article. This is freely available and is an interesting exploration of not only the information around obesity in pregnancy, but also a critical analysis of how we depend on evidence versus the stories that women tell us. So I'd really encourage you to give this article a read. I found it inspirational, and that's why I went on the journey that I went on. So all that said, I'd really like to turn to some of the critical nutrients in pregnancy. One of those is folic acid. And so we have a health file on folic acid. And what it suggests is that women 
take a daily multivitamin containing 400 micrograms of folic acid. And really what it is is all people who could have a baby or become pregnant. So once again, I was talking to some folks and they said, well, I only have sex with women. So I can't really become pregnant, so I probably don't need to take that. I said, well, yeah, that's probably true. And they said, and my friend, who is a trans man, could become pregnant. And so really, he should be taking the 400 micrograms of folic acid. And I said, well, you know, that's probably right. So I really revised my advice to say that all people who could have a baby or become pregnant should take a multivitamin, including 400 micrograms of folic acid. Now, when it comes to healthy eating for pregnancy, a number of issues come up, right? And so first off, we have the issue of nausea. We'll also talk about heartburn, and we'll talk about constipation. Now, the thing about nausea is there's very little that helps. There are prescription drugs that help, and if people have severe nausea in pregnancy, then they should consult a physician because there are prescription drugs that are fairly effective, not completely effective. And I don't know if there is any drug that's completely effective. There are excellent studies that talk about ginger. And so I provided you with this fabulous three ginger bar cookie recipes. And fortuitously, we have some of those here with us today. I'll bring them right up to the camera. There they are, the three ginger bar cookies, because they have powdered ginger, and they have fresh ginger, and they also have candied ginger in them. And they're actually pretty easy to make because you just kind of beat together the sugar and the butter, beat in some molasses, and I use blackstrap molasses, even though you'll see the original recipe called for fancy molasses. You see the original recipe, it's one of those old standbys from March 15th, 2000, published in the Vancouver Sun. <laughs> what a wonderful day that is. It is. <laughs> so I use blackstrap molasses because it provides extra calcium and iron for these cookies. Uh, and you just beat these all together, and then you scrape the whole batter into a jelly roll sheet, or some of you may think of it as a cookie sheet with a rim. And then you just spread it out and pop it in the oven, bake it for about 20 minutes, and pull it out, let it sit for 15 minutes, and then cut it into bars. And so you guys are welcome to try some of those. Oh, thank you. I'm not going to because I have to keep talking. <laughs> but this is a great ginger recipe. Now remember, people can also just buy fresh ginger, chop it up, and pour boiling water on it to make ginger tea. That um, non-alcoholic ginger beer is a great way to get a lot of ginger. There is the crystallized ginger, just like I used in these cookies, that people can use. And the other thing is the pickled ginger, like you get when you order sushi. That's a great way to eat ginger. So there's a variety of ways for people to eat ginger, and that really has been shown to be equally effective to non-prescription medication like Dramamine or Gravol. Uh, the next health file is BC Health File 68H, and it's about fiber. Right, so uh, people often experience constipation during pregnancy, and that's because, as I explained to them, they have a baby in their belly. That means everything has to get past that baby in order to get out again. And a lot of people have a lot of problems with constipation, so I really encourage pregnant women to increase the fiber that they eat. And of course, that means focusing on higher fiber foods like the bran in whole grains and whole grains themselves. The other thing is uh, peas and beans and lentils. Those are all great sources of fiber. Health File 68H here is a great guideline to lots of different high fiber foods. The other thing that I've included is this lemon bran loaf recipe. And once again, no. we have <laughs> lemon loaf with bran. Oops. And so that lemon loaf with bran, I actually made this half and half with all-purpose flour and whole wheat flour, which is why it probably didn't rise as high, 
but it actually has an extra little bit of nutrition from the whole wheat. Uh, this, you can see, is a recipe from the Rogers Company, who coincidentally make bran. <laughs> and um, this is uh, actually cut off of a bag of bran. And you can see it's copyright 1983. Wow. So it's just nothing like those old standby recipes. I actually make this a lot. And when you have to bring baked goods somewhere, this is generally what I bring. So we've talked about nausea. We've talked about uh, constipation. I should also mention about heartburn. Uh, and the sad news is, is that I don't have a lot of recommendations. Once again, a lot of women experience heartburn during their pregnancy because they have a baby in their belly. And that baby is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And it starts to push up on your stomach. And what that does is pushes the contents of your stomach up into your esophagus, and that gives you heartburn. So there's a number of really mechanical things that you can do, uh, but my experience has been that they help, but they don't completely resolve the heartburn. So one of the things you can do is to eat smaller meals more frequently during the day, because what that does is there's less food in your stomach at one time, so the baby pushing upwards just can't, doesn't push hard enough to push food into your esophagus. So eating small meals regularly throughout the day can help with heartburn. Another thing that can really help is separating your consumption of solids and liquids. Because the less liquid the contents of your stomach are, the harder they are to push up into your esophagus. So if you have liquids in between your small frequent meals, then that makes a difference to heartburn because it makes a difference to the fluidity of your stomach contents. The other thing that uh, a friend of mine who's a dietitian who suffers from heartburn tells me is that uh, lifting up the head of your bed on a couple of phone books or bricks really makes a difference because what it means is you're sleeping downhill. And just that little bit of angle means that gravity can work, and gravity can really help keep the contents of your stomach, particularly when you're lying down and your stomach is more prone to heartburn. So eating small frequent meals, separating solids and liquids, and lifting up the head of your bed are the main things that you can do to decrease risk for heartburn. Many women get heartburn late in pregnancy when their baby is larger. The last thing I'd like to talk about is food safety, because there are a number of things that come up around food safety, and actually it's the most often asked question that I encounter. And it's actually specifically about sushi. <laughs> so we have BC Health File 76, and it's quite specific. It says, no unpasteurized milk, no unpasteurized juices. It also says no raw or undercooked eggs. So this means no soft boiled eggs and no foods like homemade mayonnaise or hollandaise sauce. Uh, one of the reasons this comes forward is that our food supply has actually changed. Their uh, eggs used to be safer than they are today. Used to be that salmonella was only on the outside of the shells. And so the shells had to be cracked and to let the salmonella into the egg. Now we find that some eggs actually have salmonella inside the shell before the shell is ever cracked. So it's really important that eggs be well cooked, that they be cooked until they're solid. Deli meats and hot dogs need to be cooked well. So these are foods that we often, particularly deli meats, we often don't cook them. Uh, hot dogs, we generally cook them, but Sometimes we'll just heat them up. So we need to make sure that they are well boiled. Uh, the other thing is soft cheeses. Brie, camembert, feta, queso fresco, and queso blanco from Mexico. These soft cheeses carry some risk. No uncooked sprouts. So things like alfalfa sprouts or radish sprouts that people might want to put on sandwiches. Those have been a real food safety risk. No uncooked shellfish, so no raw shrimps, no raw oysters. 
uh, and no liver pate. Right? Now, one of the things is, is that in BC, we take a fairly stern outlook and we have very clear advice and we say, don't eat these foods. Mother Risk, which is a national organization, they've, take un, they've taken a bit more moderate outlook. And so specifically around um, soft cheeses, they say what's really important is that we make sure we're getting them from reputable sources, right? So soft ripened cheeses and deli meats, consume them in moderation and obtain them from reputable stores. So places that you believe to be clean, wholesome, food safe stores are great places to buy these deli meats and producers that are large producers, reputable producers for soft cheeses. They also note that cooking is the most effective method to inactivate parasites, but flash freezing is also effective. So what this means is that you should check with any sushi store to find out if they freeze their fish, because freezing will inactivate parasites. So pregnant women don't need to avoid raw fish, but they need, once again, to make sure that they're getting it from a sushi restaurant where they're satisfied with the cleanliness and food safety practices of the restaurant and that they store their fish and their sushi properly and they consume it soon after purchase. And they also probably want to inquire about the practice of freezing fish because that will reduce their risk for parasites. It also notes that women should limit their consumption of high mercury fish, including fresh tuna and yellowtail. And once again, we have an excellent health file from British Columbia, health file 68M, which gives these recommendations that for BC caught tuna, there are no limits. Uh, but like uh, for pregnant or breastfeeding women, they should limit their mercury containing fish servings to two to four servings per week. There's also some recommendations there for canned tuna for six to 24 month olds and for two to 12 year olds. So we recommend limiting canned tuna consumption for uh, young children and toddlers as well. So the great thing about this health file is that it gives you three categories. You can see that there are some fishes that you can eat freely. There's also some that you probably want to moderate your intake of, and there's a few that you probably want to eat very infrequently because of their mercury content. One thing to remember is that small fish that don't live very long are pretty much methylmercury free. So that's things like sardines and herring and ooligan. Those are all great choices to eat because they don't live very long, and so they don't have any opportunity to accumulate mercury. Most pregnant women should be taking a supplement. Now, most, most women are. Almost everyone <laughs> takes like one at Materna or Orf or F. There's a variety of or generics, right? They should include B12. They should include a significant source of iron because uh, iron is an important nutrient during pregnancy, both for the pregnant woman herself, but also for her baby. Because women who are anemic during pregnancy give birth to babies who are at higher risk for anemia uh, before six months of age when we're introducing sources of iron into their diets. The other thing is that fish is an excellent source of omega-3s, and so we like to encourage women who like fish to eat fish uh, 150 grams of fish per week. So that's two Canada Food Guide servings of fish per week. And once again, to choose fish that's low in mercury. Now, all of these recommendations are available on the Healthy Families BC website. You just go to healthyfamiliesbc.ca and you can click on the parenting link, pregnancy and parenting. And you'll see it there. The picture, I think, has changed since when I did this screenshot. Uh, but uh, again, those links should be live in the PDF. And you should be able to take them uh, and follow them 
to these links on the website. And so the time has come for us to move along to boobies, right? And this is where I talk about breastfeeding. And this, uh, I worked with Dr. Jack Newman on the um, Nutrition for Healthy Term Infants. And uh, I had always admired Jack. Uh, but this really took me over the edge into hero worship. This is a picture of Jack with a trans man named Trevor. And Trevor, uh, Jack helped Trevor reestablish his breast milk so that he could breastfeed his son, as he's doing here. So um, once again, it's really exciting to see that uh, Trevor, you may have seen him in the news a while back, that he applied to be a lactation consultant with the La Leche League of Canada. And they actually refused because they say, well, we only accept girls to be La Leche leaders. <laughs> and so uh, Trevor was trying to get them to accept him because he has a lot of insights that other people may not have. So uh, I was uh, really impressed uh, just seeing uh, Jack and Trevor together here in this photo. So Canada, like many countries around the world, based their recommendations on the World Health Organization recommendation that exclusive breastfeeding is recommended for the first six months, with continued breastfeeding for up to two years and beyond. And you'll find this recommendation in Baby's Best Chance, page 98. 98 to 109, and that has lots and lots of breastfeeding information. There's also a HealthLink BC file on breastfeeding that's available. The thing about breastfeeding is there's lots and lots and lots of good things to say about it, uh, but um, it's hard to do those without talking to a woman who is actually breastfeeding that women need support for breastfeeding, often from lactation consultants. One of the things that does run through a lot of the benefits of breastfeeding is this video called You Won't Regret It. It's an excellent video. I'm not going to play it right now, but those links are live. Uh, and so those of you who have PDFs, this one is a five minute video from Newfoundland and talks about all of the benefits of breastfeeding. And so I'll just quickly go through some of those. Uh, certainly, we know that breastfeeding makes babies smarter, right? That they have enhanced cognitive development. That's not saying that no baby is going to be stupid because they're not breastfed. I come from a generation that wasn't breastfed and Lord knows I'm smart enough. <laughs> so it just means that your baby grows into their full potential for smartness. Imagine how smart I could have been if I'd been breastfed. <laughs> Breastfeeding also builds immunity, and you hear a lot about this. It protects against gastrointestinal infections, so less likelihood of diarrhea, right? Less likelihood of earaches, acute otitis media, right? Less likely to have colds, respiratory tract infections, and a dramatic reduction in sudden infant death syndrome. So we know that breastfeeding is protective because it builds immunity. It also dramatically enhances the bond between child and mom. And of course, there's lower costs for breastfeeding and you don't have to heat it up, you don't have to sterilize. The ease of delivery is right there. So there are a lot of benefits of breastfeeding. You can find a ton of information about these either at the Health Canada website or at a variety of sources online. What we need to remember is that here in British Columbia, we have excellent initiation of breastfeeding, that almost everybody is starting to breastfeed. What we don't have is great duration, that soon after women leave the hospital, many women stop breastfeeding, and our duration rates fall dramatically to about just under 50% in First Nations communities at six months, right? So they go from almost everyone and cut in half by six months. Now, that said, the First Nations communities are doing much, much better than BC as a whole, that we actually have much better duration rates in First Nations community than the population as a whole. So it's really important to remember that duration 
is as important to promote as is initiation. And one of the things that really makes a difference is the Breastfeeding Committees of Canada Baby Friendly Initiative. And what the goal is, is to have everyone become baby friendly, right? And it's critical that managerial and director support is needed. And this is something that I personally am advocating for within the health authority, is that all health authority sites will become baby friendly. Uh, many simple, many sample guidelines have been developed. And again, if you click on the Breastfeeding Committee of Canada's Baby Friendly Initiative, then, well, let's, let's give that a try. Uh, it should take you to the um, Baby Friendly Initiative information. Nothing's happening, so, although I got the little I've got a little I'm thinking gear happening, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see what happens. That I don't want to spend a lot of time going through all of the 10 steps of the Baby Friendly Initiative, but if you follow those 10 steps, then you'll become baby friendly and, oh, here we go. Oh, it's not coming up on screen there. Oh, no, she's working. This is yours. Right yeah. Sure. Okay. We're waiting. We'll see what happens. It's coming up on my computer, but we have several computers here. They're all delivering to different sites. Oh, it's not coming up on this one. Okay. Okay. So the thing to remember about the Baby Friendly Initiative is that there are 10 steps. They're not hard to implement, but they do make a difference to duration. And there's an excellent study out of Australia that showed that working through the 10 steps improves breastfeeding duration rates in all communities that have gone through those 10 steps, right? Whether or not they're accredited is not as critical as going through the 10 steps. All health centers should have designated areas for breastfeeding, for clients, for staff, and they should make sure that people feel welcome to breastfeed a baby anywhere in the facility. So there may be a designated area, but anybody can breastfeed anywhere, right? Now, one of the women that I work with on the um, advisory panel for Health Canada sent an excellent comments in an email, and I've copied these and I'm sharing them. And it says practically what's needed. She says, mothers need space to nurse. I have mixed feelings about little rooms set aside for this purpose. On one hand, it can be beneficial for the child to have decreased stimulation, usually not an issue for the older child. Done well, these rooms can be a little haven for a quiet break. Done poorly, these rooms smack of broom closet and your knees hit against the diaper pail when you try to move the glider rocker. So I'd rather see less segregation and a space right in the waiting room. Maybe a boppy pillow with a removable cover and a, clack of, a stack of clean receiving blankets. If it's a clinic, particularly where linens have to be laundered anyways. A tub of wipes to clean the spit ups and a poster or a fun fact quote about nursing on the wall that might be all that's needed to communicate this non-verbal support. Sure, the blankets and pillows probably wouldn't get that much use, but it's the atmosphere that counts. That mothers need time to nurse. Generally, I've been pleasantly surprised by the doctors and nurses who, upon seeing that my child is nursing, went out of their way to let the child finish before continuing with an exam or procedure. Likewise, after an intervention, I've been told to take all the time I need before freeing up the exam room. That said, I'm not sure that all healthcare providers are sensitive to this. Mothers need flexibility. Every mother-child diet is different. Some crave the privacy of a separate space. Others would rather you offer them a glass of water rather than usher them to another room as if they have to hide. The same flexibility encouraged in training the staff that serves the nursing mother and child will go a long way to accepting different nursing styles and more to the point, different nursing ages. Mothers need to hear again and again that this is normal. I'm always a little shocked to see the free samples of formula, which are undermining, but no breast pads. Literature and magazines provided for the pregnant or new mom advertise maternity wear, 
good for part of nine months. But nursing wear, which could serve for years, is a hard to find specialty item. So I thought these were such eloquent thoughts. I wanted to share them with you. That the Healthy Families BC website has a whole section on breastfeeding. And it's a fantastic session that has a number of videos that are targeted to the new mom at home who's who might be encountering some problems with things like breastfeeding, breast, com breast compression, or just minor irritation around breastfeeding. And there's excellent videos at the website around breastfeeding. So that's uh, an amazing resource for breastfeeding moms, because we all know that breastfeeding moms have all the time to start up the computer and go on the internet when they're having an issue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, another wonderful video. This video is only about two minutes long. It's called Teach Me How to Breastfeed. It's a rap video about breastfeeding. <laughs> so I uh, really encourage you to go and visit. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the time today, but this is a fantastic video on breastfeeding. I like to talk too about vitamin D supplementation. We know that vitamin D is important, that all healthy full-term infants who are breastfed in Canada should receive a daily vitamin D supplement of 400 international units. Right? Supplementation should begin at birth and continue until the infant's diet includes at least 400 international units per day from other dietary sources or until the breastfed infant reaches one year of age. That infants who are breastfed beyond one year, i.e. all infants, <laughs> should get 600 international units of vitamin D from food or supplements. So it's really critically important that babies get this vitamin D. And the thing is, is that vitamin D really is from the sun. There are not very many foods that actually contain vitamin D. This is the HealthLink BC file on calcium and vitamin D and includes the recommendations for both calcium and the recommendations for vitamin D. And it also includes a short list of foods that contain vitamin D because sadly, very few foods do. Uh, that good sources of vitamin D are things like fortified milk and fortified milk alternatives, fortified margarine, and also fortified butter, right? But how much butter and margarine are you gonna eat? <laughs> and then things like fish, so again, oligan, sardines, those are great sources, uh, liver, Egg yolk are the only foods that naturally contain vitamin D. Vitamin D is hard to come by. And of course, from October until April here in Canada, we get no vitamin D from the sun whatsoever. And so it's really critically important that babies do receive the vitamin D because it makes for strong bones. It helps prevent rickets. But more than just rickets, there's lots of ongoing research with vitamin D. Oh, went too far. There we go. Lots of ongoing research with vitamin D, and we know about links between vitamin D status in adults, and we know links between cancers, multiple sclerosis, and other diseases. The adult recommendations vary from agency to agency. So the osteoporosis folks have one recommendation, the cancer folks have another recommendation. At this time, Health Canada recommends 600 international units from age one to age 70. So that 600 international units should carry you for quite a few years. Uh, that I think there will be ongoing research. There's interesting research in South Carolina about supplementing moms with vitamin D to try to increase the vitamin D status of their, in, of their infants. So we'll see what happens with that. That's looking at very large doses of vitamin D. So there's interesting research going on out there uh, about all levels of vitamin D and when we next get these, there, there was an increase in the recommendation at the, the last updating of the recommended daily allowances and I'm sure there'll be one in the next recommendations as well. So that 
pretty much brings to a conclusion our section on breastfeeding. Sadly, there's not a lot to tell about breastfeeding because when it works well, moms and babes don't need a lot of information. When it's not going well, there are often lactation consultants or aunties and grandmas that have excellent advice around breastfeeding. And so I'd really encourage women who are pregnant to find breastfeeding supports because it's the supports that make the, the difference to duration. So having talked about breastfeeding, now we'll move on to bottles. That breastfeeding should always be encouraged and the provision of formula information to health professionals is not intended to encourage the substitution of commercial breast milk substitutes for breast milk. Now, formula is often characterized as the next best thing to breastfeeding, but that's actually quite inaccurate. Formula is not the next best thing. At best, it's the fourth choice in a hierarchy that absolutely the best thing for moms and babies is breastfeeding itself. The second best choice is feeding expressed breast milk. So breast milk that's been pumped from mom and fed to baby. The third choice is the feeding of pasteurized human donor milk, which is available here in uh, the lower mainland and can be shipped around the province for acutely ill infants. There are also milk banks cropping up around the province. Chilliwack is starting, is trying to get one going, and this is something that's really moved. The Canadian Pediatric Society has voiced significant support for milk banks across Canada. So we're seeing a movement for the provision of pasteurized human donor milk. And so fourth in this hierarchy is the feeding of commercial breast milk substitutes. So next time somebody says, well, formula is the next best thing, you can say, well, actually, no, it's, it's actually fourth. So <laughs> uh, there's two different health files on uh, feeding formula, one about safely preparing formula and one about feeding formula. And one of the key points that I make is that Health File 69B states, if your baby is formula fed, you must be careful to safely prepare and store the formula because if not, your baby can get sick. So babies can get sick from formula. And it's important to communicate that well, that baby formula needs to be very carefully prepared and stored. Now, this is a study that was released a couple of years back, and it talks about sicknesses that occur. And the reason that I include it is because it's worth noting that around Enterobacter Sakazaki, which is a very serious illness uh, amongst formula-fed infants, while they have occurred, there have only been 46 cases worldwide between 1958 and 2005 with other outbreaks associated with Ciderobacter frindi and Salmonella. So while babies getting sick from formula does occur, that moms are clearly taking enough care around safely preparing formula that they are very infrequent, 46 cases in over 50 years. So we really do need to prepare formula carefully, but always keep in mind that the frequency of illness associated with formula is quite infrequent. I'm often telling people that your baby is more likely to get struck by lightning than to become ill from safely prepared formula. One of the key things about formula is that the price or the brand is not an indicator of quality. You can spend a lot or you can spend a little. It doesn't really matter because the composition of formula is very tightly regulated. People have very little flexibility in what they can put in infant formula. Health Canada is very, very strict about what goes into formula. And so formula is more or less the same. There's not really a lot of differences amongst formulas. And that's why price or brand isn't really an indicator. That all that said, what we find is that 
Some infants tolerate some formulas better than other formulas. Some infants, they have really lucky moms, and they can just be fed whatever's on sale. And they'll switch from one formula to another, and it's no problems at all. Other infants, they don't tolerate anyone except maybe one formula. And they have to have that one formula all the time, or they get gassy, and they get sick, and their stools change, and all kinds of issues arise. So some infants tolerate some formulas better than other formulas, and you'll have to work this out with your infant, because some babies can eat anything, some babies can only eat one kind. We do have one point on here, Jerry, on yes. how we connect. We've been having more technical issues on here. <laughs> And we seem to be having some lag time and delay that is making it really hard. So we've been trying to work those out with no success. So um, some uh, Nuka wants to make a point. She said, I'm going to, oh, she's going to cut this short as the sound comes in and out throughout the entire session. However, she would like to raise one point, and that is that she has read that the intake of fish from the coast of BC should be minimized because of the radiation found in the fish due to Fukushima. Mm -hmm. I feel that it is important point to raise due to the obvious health risks. Thank you. And I agree, that's an important point to raise. I haven't yet looked at the radiation and radioactivity levels in fish, so I can't comment uh, knowledgeably about that issue. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, I do think that it's worth taking it into account, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, and speaking of fish, one of the main things that we think about is uh, DHA and ARA. So that's omega-3 and omega-6 fats that are added to some formula. Now the reason that this is added to formula is that uh, it's found in breast milk, right? And so some formulas have it added. The amount in breast milk depends on how much omega-3 fat mom eats, in other words, Basically, it's about how much fish mom eats. That if mom eats a lot of fish, breast milk tends to be higher in omega-3 fatty acids. If mom doesn't eat as much fish, then it tends to be lower. What we don't know is what an optimal level is. And so the formulas are fortified to all different levels. So there's lots of different levels of omega-3 fortification of formula. We don't know that more is better, and we don't know that less is better. So we really don't know, and the formula companies are just putting an amount in. Some use things like the standard amount in breast milk in Canada. Others use a recommendation that was made by the World Health Organization. Others use other means to determine how much omega-3 fatty acid to put into their formula. So we know that it's important for brain development and vision, but we haven't determined that getting it from formula makes a difference. Can I get you to repeat that answer again? I have a lot of people that didn't hear the response to the question. To the, yeah. the question about radioactivity? Yes. Okay, so there was a question, uh, a comment offered from the audience uh, via Adobe Connect that commented that there are concerns around the consumption of fish from BC coastal waters that uh, were raised around the Fukushima nuclear plant and the radioactivity leakage from that plant and asking, you know, how safe is it to eat fish? And I said that I cannot knowledgeably comment on that because I haven't researched that to this point in time. And so I agree that it is an issue of concern and we should be cautious uh, about our consumption. But I cannot give any advice about how much to consume or not consume when it comes to BC coastal caught fish. I need to take a sip of water after that. <laughs> So, uh, returning to omega-3 fatty acids in formula, premature infants should definitely be fed a formula with DHA, ARA, or with omega-3 fats until nine months corrected age. The benefits to term infants are as yet unproven. So all that said, 
to me, it's kind of like, well, there's certainly no harm from feeding these formulas, and there might be benefits. And so my guidance is always that if you can find omega-3 fatty acid enriched formula for the same price as non-enriched formula, then I would feed the enriched formula. Typically, it can be more costly, but there's a variety. Uh, many of the off-label brands, like Kirkland brand or Life brand or those kind of things, they are the same price, whether they're omega-3 fortified or not. So I really encourage parents to feed these, particularly if they have kids that can you know, eat any old formula. So uh, I think that there's no proof that they're advantageous. But in the absence of that proof, it seems like a good idea to feed them. The next issue that comes up, uh, and this is a fairly new thing, is probiotics. Uh, so you have an opportunity to introduce probiotic bacteria to your baby once they're eating food. That if formula is safely prepared according to directions, then the probiotics will not be alive when you feed them to your baby. And so uh, it's really questionable whether there's a lot of benefit to feeding formula that has added probiotics. There is certainly no proof out there that probiotics are any benefit. So really, this is a thing that, again, particularly given that these formulas are often more costly, there's no proof that they are of any benefit. So I really, it's like, there's no real reason to use these probiotic enhanced formulas. Follow-on formulas are also acceptable, but not necessary. That from six months to 12 months, there are formulas that are heavily marketed based on their calcium content. And they say, oh, well, this formula is perfect for after six months. But regular formula is also nutritionally appropriate straight through to 12 months. So after 12 months, then follow-on formulas uh, can be used, that formula-fed infants who are formula-fed beyond 12 months should be fed follow-on formula. But from zero months to 12 months, standard formula is just fine. Also after 12 months, infants can be fed cow's milk or the milk of other mammals. So that's probably a significantly less costly alternative to feeding follow-on formula. So the issue around follow-on formulas is that they're often fed well beyond 12 months, but they're not nutritionally necessary when there's, there's other less costly alternatives. There is a question. And yes. Yeah, um, um, what would you recommend to nursing mothers while milk supply isn't coming in enough? Example, I nursed both my kids, but my firstborn was starving because my milk wasn't producing enough to meet her needs. I had to go to formula at three weeks old, but my son, I was, okay, so I guess just suggest. Right, so what I would suggest is, again, if there is pasteurized human donor milk available to you, then that would be the next best choice. I would also encourage moms to continue to breastfeed because women's bodies are set to make milk and it's uh, supply and demand. So as supply, uh, sorry, as demand continues, in other words, as your baby keeps nursing, your baby, uh, sorry, your body will produce more milk. That said, there are women who aren't producing enough milk and they can certainly supplement with formula. My recommendation would be that they feed a standard cow's milk formula all formulas, and we'll talk about cow's milk formulas and iron momentarily, but any standard cow's milk formula would be fine. So that would be uh, any, any brand or off-label brand. Uh, as I said, price or brand is not an indicator of quality, that Health Canada regulates cow, 
regulates infant formula very strictly. Moving on, Health File 69B here uh, on safely preparing formula notes that if formula has been warmed up or partly used for a feed, it must be thrown out after one hour. It should not be put in the fridge to be used again. And this is an enormous issue, again, because of the cost of formula. Many people, if they give their baby a bottle and they only drink a little tiny bit, well, they want to keep it. It's after an hour, sadly, it's garbage. That really any bottle that has been fed, uh, particularly if it's been warmed up, should be thrown out after one hour. It should never be reused. Can I ask you something? I was trying to type the response that they didn't um, hear the last bit about the cow's milk and the formula. Can you repeat it? And I will actually yeah. type it in as you Is that when parents choose to feed formula, whether it's as an exclusive feed or to supplement breast milk, then they should be choosing a cow's milk formula with iron. Now that's Sorry, I'm just cow's sorry. milk formula with iron. Iron. Okay, I just wanted to make sure they had the right answer. Yeah, and we'll talk more about iron in a moment or two. Uh, so one issue is that some infants who are formula fed need a specialized formula because they don't tolerate cow's milk formula. So they need an extensively hydrolyzed casein formula or a partially hydrolyzed whey formula. So if there is a medically defined need for a specialized formula, then those medically defined needs are supported through either social assistance or First Nations benefits. Uh, the Health 30 is calling them something new. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> it, but it, it's the former, oh, it's sorry, it is written up here, First Nations Health Benefits. That's what it's called. It's the former uh, non-insured health benefits. So the, if th there's a doctor or medical practitioner's prescription for a medically defined need for specialized formula, then those are accessible. So Health File 69A on formula feeding your baby recommends that milk-based commercial infant formula is advised unless otherwise advised for, by your doctor or healthcare provider. And follow-up formulas are not needed in, for babies less than 12 months of age. So it's uh, milk-based commercial infant formula is really the uh, sole appropriate food aside from human milk. And uh, there might be a specialized formula needed for infants, say, who have an allergic sibling or a parent with allergies. There may be specialized formulas recommended by physicians in those instances. The other words that you hear a lot about infant formula is the term iron fortified. And this term came into usage when there used to be formulas that contained very, very little iron and iron fortified formulas. But now all formula sold in Canada contains iron. The iron's added at differing levels. The lowest is about 0.7 milligrams per 100 milliliters. There's one that might be slightly lower than that. The highest is around 1.3, 1.4 milligrams per 100 milliliters. So the good news is, is that all formula contain enough iron to meet infants' needs until they can get iron from other foods, right? The introduction of solids should definitely have a focus on high iron foods, but all formula contain enough iron to meet infants' needs until they get iron from food. So a commercial cow's milk formula, it doesn't necessarily have, they all contain iron. It doesn't have to be labeled iron fortified. Some of them still use those words on the label all formulas are appropriate. So all formula sold in Canada has enough iron to meet baby's needs. There are a few specialized formulas that don't contain iron because a few babies need those specialized formulas. But everything sold at the retail level has enough iron to meet baby's needs. 
Follow-on formulas, as I said, are not necessary. They're appropriate, but not necessary for 6 to 12 months. Parents who feed formula beyond 12 months must switch to follow-on formula because infants' calcium needs start to increase at around a year. A lot of parents worry about constipation because babies' stools change, often quite dramatically, when formula is introduced. If you have a breastfed baby, which is like 96% of babies in BC, and you switch them to formula, their stools will change. Their poo will be dramatically different. Uh, and a lot of parents worry, either because the consistency of the stools change or the frequency of stools change, that breastfed infants usually have more frequent bowel movements than formula-fed infants, and the appearance of the stools are quite different. Uh, the smells, too. So, <laughs> just because your baby's stool changes doesn't mean that they are constipated. True constipation means hard, dry, pebbly stools. It's not about frequency. We tell people it's everything from 10 times a day to once every 10 days. All of those are normal. It's about the consistency and only a really specific consistency. Hard, dry, pebbly stools. Those are constipated babies and really you should be consulting a healthcare professional if your baby has hard, dry, pebbly stools. There are thickened formulas in the marketplace. They have added rice starch, and that thickens on contact with stomach acid, but there's very little research that this will actually prevent reflux and regurgitation. So I am not in favor of the use of these formulas, and I think there are actually some risks in that with standard formula, if a baby were to regurgitate it and actually inhale some of it, they could cough it out because it's thin. But this thickened formula, I worry that if babies regurgitate it and accidentally inhale it, now they have to cough out a thick liquid, and that's much harder to cough out. So I think that this is a product that there is no need for. So I encourage parents just to feed standard formula and work other ways to prevent reflux and regurgitation, making sure babies are well burped, make, keeping babies vertical after they've been fed. Those kind of things can really have a, a big impact. Soy formula. There's a lot of questions around soy formula. And the, the key point that I try to make is that there's really no reason to feed soy formula. The only appropriate reason to feed soy formula is for vegan infants or infants that have galactosemia. So galactosemia is a special condition that babies can't digest the sugars in milk and it causes very serious problems. Uh, so if you have an infant with galactosemia, you'll know <laughs> because your doctor will have told you. So if you're a vegan, then soy formula may be appropriate. If you have an infant with galactosemia, it's appropriate. There is no human studies confirming harm from soy formula, but the long-term effects do remain controversial. And this is because soy as a sole source of nutrition, uh, people are concerned that the phytoestrogens in soy may, can, may be detrimental to an infant's health. And so, we really need more research on soy and phytoestrogens. That really, there's no reason that infants who are allergic to milk formula should be fed uh, extensively hydrolyzed formula, like Nutramagen or Alimentum. And uh, people can get subsidies for the high cost of those formulas through First Nations health benefits or through social assistance. Unfortunately, people who are living on minimum wage cannot access uh, the supplementary costs for those formulas. Post-discharge formula, I'm just gonna mention briefly, this is a special formula that's marketed 
for infants who are born prematurely and it should be fed until nine months corrected age. So uh, there, this is available in the retail marketplace, but it's a really specialized formula that's for prematurely born infants after they've been discharged from the hospital. There are a couple of brands, the Similac Advanced Neosure and the Enfamil Enficare A+. These are both available only in powdered formula, sorry, only in powdered format, right? And Health File 69B recommends against powdered formula for premature or ill infants or infants less than one month of age. So it's good to remember that this formula may be recommended for your premature infant even though we generally recommend against powdered formula. Enfagro is a product that is marketed for toddlers or picky eaters. And I actually recommend against this because they end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. My baby won't eat, and so I give them Enfagro just to make sure they get lots of nutrition. And because they get Enfagro, they aren't hungry, and so they don't eat, and so then I have to give them Enfagro, and then they aren't hungry, and then they don't eat. <laughs> and so these things end up perpetuating problems with eating. So I really encourage parents who have picky eaters to continue to offer food, and we'll talk more about that. I also recommend against evaporated cow's milk formula. Uh, and this is because it doesn't have the essential fatty acids, it doesn't have a variety of nutrients, uh, that it's low in things like vitamin C and essential fatty acids, and also low in iron. Uh, and it doesn't have the fatty acids that kids need for good brain health. So I really strongly recommend against evaporated cow's milk formula. Uh, and same thing with goat's milk. Occasionally we see that somebody has recommended whole goat's milk prior to 12 months of age. And really, no goat's milk nor the milk of any mammal should really be fed prior to 12 months of age. And we'll talk about dairy and infants in a few minutes. But no goat's milk, no evaporated milk, no really breast milk or infant formula are the appropriate things to feed babies until six months of age. When we introduce by cost, and everyone always asks me, what's by cost? By cost is the German word, and it means everything besides breast milk. <laughs> it's just a wonderful word, and plus it was a, another B word for my <laughs> alliterative title. <laughs> and so we have introducing solids, right? And I chose this picture for a couple of reasons. One is that, uh, again, uh, Dr. Jack Newman tells a fairly amusing story about his son starting solids by grabbing a piece of steak off of his plate and starting to <laughs> chew on it. So it reminds me of that. And second, that uh, meat is really an excellent iron source. And as I've mentioned several times, when we're talking about the introduction of foods, we talk about introducing solids at six months with a focus on high iron foods. Babies need a variety of tastes and textures. Pureed foods are not needed. And I spent a lot of time talking to parents about this. And what I brought, am I on camera? <laughs> is this. This is my baby book, <laughs> right? It's the baby book that my mother was given when I was born. Uh, you can see that it's actually barely opened because I suspect my mother already had two boys and so she probably wasn't that interested in what it had to say. And as I look through it, I find that I'm thankful for that because the recommendations in it are dramatically different than the recommendations we make today. That uh, infants used to be introduced to solids very, very early. And that's why purees were introduced. It's because purees, uh, if you're introducing solids to a one-month-old baby, then you kind of have this long spoon, and you filled it full of puree, and you kind of dumped it down the baby's throat. 
<laughs> now that we're introducing solids at six months, there is no real need for purees. So I encourage parents to feed mashed and finger foods, even before teeth appear. And that's because I eat pureed foods, right? I eat things like hummus and applesauce and custard. They're delicious. I like them. But they're not needed. So when you're eating pureed food, your baby can have those too. But really what we want is for babies to enjoy family foods that have been texture modified by mashing, right? So uh, I often hold up a fork. And in fact, I brought a fork, but it's way over there on the other side of the table. <laughs> Hold a fork to add up because to me, that's the world's best baby food maker is a fork. Mashed potatoes, mashed bananas, and mashed peas, well, they're all different textures. And so babies get lots of different textures by enjoying mashed foods. They can certainly enjoy pureed foods. They can enjoy finely chopped foods. And particularly when we're talking about those high iron foods like meats, they probably will need to be finely chopped for babies to enjoy them. There's certainly no problem with pureeing, but pureed foods need to be part of an array of textures that babies receive. So you can start with well-cooked, finely minced meat or poultry or fish or other high iron family foods, right? So things like peas and beans and legumes are rich in iron, right? Nuts and seeds are also rich in iron. And then there's also iron fortified infant cereal or as most people call it, pablum. <laughs> and which is, let me tell you, no taste sensation. <laughs> So finely cooked meat, poultry, or fish, right? Part of it is remembering that we have always recommended the introduction of meat at six months. But what we changed is the age at which we recommended the introduction of solids. That in 2004, Canada started recommending infants be exclusively breastfed to six months of age. That means no other foods, until six months of age. And so because we always recommended meat at six months, meat is one of the very best sources of iron. We only had pablum because we used to introduce foods much earlier to infants and they couldn't manage anything except something like pablum. Now that we're introducing solids at six months, it's really great to be able to offer kids these finely minced foods. We have an excellent resource, First Foods for First Nations. I'll be sharing my email address at the end of the uh, session, and you can email me and I can send you an online link, and you can print your own copy of this. It's uh, great. It does recommend purees, and so babies can also enjoy mashed foods and finger foods. So it includes an array of recipes, some of which are purees, and some of which are mashed and chopped foods. So start with well-cooked, finely minced meat, poultry or fish, or with iron-fortified infant cereal or other high iron family foods. Now, we have a great, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a great resource that you can use when you're working with families, and that's the infant feeding timeline game. You can uh, download this online, or we still have a few copies around the office if you wanna email me and ask. You only need sort of one copy per group because uh, it's an actual game. And what you do is it has zero to six months and it has six to nine months and it has nine to 12 months and there's even a space for foods my baby doesn't need. And what you do is you distribute cards and these cards have a variety of foods depicted on them. And so you just deal out all the cards and then you invite people to put the cards where they believe they should go on the game board, right? Whether it's zero to six months uh, or nine to 12 months or foods my baby doesn't need. So it's really great. Uh, and it's a really fun game. One of the great things about the game is there's a real opportunity for discussions about what people may have heard about foods like peanut butter or egg whites, right? That Sometimes people say, oh, well, I heard I shouldn't feed egg whites until 12 months, but that, again, is outdated advice, and we really encourage uh, eggs as another source of iron.
and it just it makes life a lot easier that you don't have to like separate the yolk and the white anymore. <laughs> you can just feed your baby scrambled eggs. Here's another uh, question, or um, in reference to the increase in I believe it's celiac disease. That's how it's pronounced. I read up on it because I have a sister and a niece who have it. They recommended that babies be introduced to wheat products at the age of four months and no later than seven months to decrease their chances of developing celiac disease. What are your thoughts on this? My thoughts would be that you could introduce wheat products anytime after six months. I am wary of early introduction of solids because solids that get introduced early tend to displace more nutrition foods like breast milk or formula and that displacement because infants aren't really good at digesting until seven eight nine months and so what we want to do is make sure that they get those highly digestible nourishing foods like breast milk or infant formula until they're six months then you can introduce most foods aside from dairy so you can start with meat, but you could also very quickly introduce wheat foods. And that falls within that recommendation that was just outlined, that from six to seven months, wheat might be one food that you wanted to introduce, right? Certainly the incidence of celiac disease is going up amongst the population. And so we do need to continue to monitor that. And and the other thing is, is that the tests for celiac disease require people to have eaten wheat. So you can't actually test for celiac disease if people haven't eaten wheat. So I agree with the, the questioner that sometime before seven months is a great time to introduce wheat. Uh, the infant feeding timeline game also depicts purees, mashed food, and small pieces of food. So we've talked about whether or not purees are necessary. There's certainly foods that everyone can eat, right, and that I eat regularly, particularly hummus, right? But I really encourage parents to quickly introduce their children to mashed foods because mashed foods is a whole bunch of textures small pieces of food that kids can pick up. So kids tend to pick up food with their whole hand. They don't pinch food like this. They pick it up with their whole hand. And so there's some mashing right there, <laughs> as well as the mashing that occurs while you're trying to actually get it in your pie hole, right? So it's uh, a really great way, small pieces of soft, ready to mash foods are just as good as mashed foods if you're giving them to your baby to try. Now, family meals, I'm, I just love this resource. And uh, I'll click on it because it's a clickable link that takes you online to the resource. I love it because it's called Tasty Recipes for Your Baby and Family. And so what it encourages, this used to be a resource that used to be called Tasty Recipes for Your Baby. And we changed it to help people understand that babies need to eat your family's foods. And so it includes a number of delicious recipes that uh, things like salmon with parsley sauce, roast chicken dinner, herb vegetable pasta salad, hamburger soup, chicken or beef or lamb stew, and a recipe for kitchery. And that recipe for kitchery is what I have next. So I brought along a little demo that I've given you the recipe there, and that's the recipe. What I did was lost my, doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I fried up some onions this morning in vegetable oil and also uh, mix them with some turmeric. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take some brown basmati rice. So I brought along some brown basmati rice. Let's have lunch. <laughs> Let's have lunch. Oh, I, I'll need my um, water too. So I put in one measure of brown basmati rice and an equivalent measure of red split lentils.
and I have a cup of chopped vegetables, right? So I have some carrots and celery and cauliflower. So I'll just pop those in. And then I have, I'm going to put a bit of spice in. You can have curry, like curry powder, or you can use curry paste, right? So I brought this commercial curry paste. So I'll just use some curry powder and just put a couple of teaspoons of curry powder in. And then I'm making this in my rice cooker, so I'm just following my rice cooker's recipe. I put in two of the measuring cups of um, stuff to cook, right? I put in one cup of brown basmati rice and one, cook of, one cup of lentils. And so now I'm just going to add water to the two cup line. And I'm adding just a little bit extra, just a little tiny bit extra, because I'm using brown rice. And then I put the lid on, and I push the button. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> now we can go back to our <laughs> go back to our task at hand. And that's what kitchery is. It's just lentils cooked with uh, rice and vegetables. And so there's a yummy recipe there that I've included as part of things. And we'll be able to eat this. I hope all you, I hope all you folks out there in TV land are envious of all the foods that we have here. <laughs> <laughs> Dairy products are something that we defer until... Uh, nine to 12 months. That Remember that we recommend breastfeeding until 24 months and beyond. So it's not necessary to introduce dairy foods because human milk is a better choice for babies than cow's milk. That said, it's a world of cow's milk out there, right? And there are many delicious dairy foods. And so at nine months of age, you can introduce foods like cheese, or yogurt, and maybe even sips of fluid milk. But you should wait until 12 months before introducing cow's milk as a milk beverage. Right? So babies can drink cow's milk. And the reason that we defer cow's milk is not because of allergies or anything like that, but because we know that kids that drink a lot of cow's milk will often go iron deficient. And so we want to prevent iron deficiency by deferring the introduction of fluid cow's milk. So babies can have little sips of milk, and they could have milk in foods, like milk in lemon bran loaf, for example. <laughs> but they really need cheese or yogurt. Um, sorry, I misspoke myself. They don't need cheese or yogurt. They can have cheese or yogurt at about nine months of age. And at 12 months, they can continue to be breastfed, and they can also get cow's milk to drink. When it comes to preventing allergies, we know that delaying or deferring potentially allergenic food is not shown to prevent allergies. So waiting to introduce nuts or fish or soy or strawberries or oranges or any of the things people say, oh, you can't feed them this, we, we don't know how to prevent allergies, that we know that deferring foods doesn't help. And so when it comes to feeding kids, there is a division of responsibility. Parents are responsible for what children are offered and the manner in which it's presented. Children are responsible for how much and even whether they eat. And that's why I love the picture that I've included on this slide. Right? Because it shows that division of responsibility played out with an infant. We've chosen what to feed. This mom has chosen to breastfeed. And we let infants decide how much or even whether they'll eat. No one says, you have to sit here until this breast is empty. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> we let kids stop eating when they're full. Once we start feeding food, there's no change to that. According to the division of responsibility, children 
are responsible for how much or even whether they eat. That means all children should now be freed from the clean your plate club. Right? I even have a little card that I hand out at health fairs that says you're relieved of your membership for the clean plate club that what that does is it externalizes eating that it says oh mom knows how much i should eat or this package knows how much i should eat when in fact we want to start eating when we're hungry eat until we're full and then stop eating without pressure children can and will eat enough to grow that kids know how much food fits in their belly it's critically important that parents decide what to eat because kids only have one criteria to, de to decide on what food, and that's like and don't like. So it's really important that parents decide what to eat because they know about nutrition. They can learn more about nutrition by reading up. They know what foods are culturally important to their families. They know what kinds of foods they want their family to eat. So it's very important that parents decide what. I also run into a lot of parents who say, oh, well, my kids will only eat this, and so that's all I ever feed them. I say, no, then they're deciding, right? They're, they're the ones who are dictating, and parents have to decide what. Parents also have to decide the manner in which food is presented, the time, because they can tell time, and they know that some time has passed since the last time we ate, and they know the manner in which we want to eat in our house, that in our house we're going to sit around a low table on the floor, or we're going to sit at the dining room table, and we know that you shouldn't slap your sister while you're eating, and they know all those behavioral things about the manner in which food is presented. They know that we're going to eat with chopsticks, or with a knife and fork, or with our hands. Parents know all of that stuff. Kids know how much food fits in their belly. And so children must decide how much to eat. And, of course, we have a BC Health File on this, Health File 69D. Uh, health File 69E is a whole bunch of meal and snack ideas for one to three-year-olds. So this is a great resource, has lots and lots of meal and snack ideas. Uh, also, there is a Vancouver Coastal Health resource available at uh, the same place as that foods for your baby and family, and that's at vch.eduhealth.ca. So generally, parents should think about offering three meals and one to three scheduled snacks. So basically, breakfast and then a snack and then lunch and then a snack and then dinner and then a snack. <laughs> so uh, kids have little tiny stomachs right, about the size of a walnut. And so they need to eat frequently. And so it's really important to have those three meals and three snacks. And it's really important that parents decide what's offered, but kids have to decide how much. And really, they should have water to drink in between. That the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages is a real issue, particularly amongst kids that have those frequently. Meals, we should have four food groups, snacks, two or three or four food groups. That's really up to you as parents. That kids should be drinking water. Uh, I really discourage parents from choosing fruit juice because fruit is better than juice. That uh, at Islam, the Squamish Family Center, they say, chew your juice. I really like that because it's much, much better for kids to eat fruit than it is for them to drink juice. If they do drink juice, they should be limited to half a cup a day or less. And this is why I encourage parents to offer fruit instead of juice, because I tell them, you explain to your two-year-old toddler that they've already had half a cup and they can't have any more. <laughs> so good luck with that. <laughs> uh, milk should also be limited. That Kids shouldn't drink more than three cups of milk, and generally two cups of milk is a good amount for kids to drink. And that might be 
uh, spread over a day. So that's 500 milliliters or two eight ounce cups of milk a day. They might have smaller amounts more frequently throughout the day. But kids that drink more than three cups of milk are very likely to be iron deficient. Too much milk or juice creates a high risk for iron deficiency or anemia. And so early on, good eaters learn that when they're hungry, they'll be fed and that their personal food preferences will be respected and that eating is an enjoyable activity. They also learn that there are ways of dealing with uncomfortable feelings besides eating. And they learn that people in different cultures have different ways of eating and they celebrate special occasions with food. They also learn that our food choices affect our well-being and that food is made available through the efforts of many members of the community, not just mom and dad. They learn that when we eat, we use up resources and we create waste and all of those things need to be done responsibly. And so if you want to learn more about feeding kids, I highly recommend the ellensatterinstitute.org. And once again, that is a hyperlink that's included in the PDF. This is Satter's book, The Secrets of Feeding a Healthy Family, but many of the book's best resources are available free of charge at the Ellen Satter Institute. And so I can click on that. Uh, what it shows is there's a section called How to Feed. And if you click on the How to Feed Children, then you get a whole bunch of resources that uh, make uh, feeding kids very clear and very easy. That it always comes back to that division of responsibility in feeding. And so I just wanted to include a few more resources. Uh, this slide is about the BC Association of Farmers Markets. So you'll find any farmers market in the province listed here. And you can see there's a link there called Find a Market Now. There's also the urban uh, cityfarmer.org. And cityfarmer.org has lots of great ideas for growing food in containers. So uh, those of you who are interested in growing more of your food, this is a great resource. There's also Fresh Choice Kitchens, and that has a search for community kitchens everywhere in the province. So you can see that there's a keyword search there, and you can just search for community kitchens everywhere in the province. And then last but not least, here's how you contact me. So I work with both the First Nations Health Authority and Vancouver Coastal Health. You can reach me by typing my name, jerry.caston, and either at FNHA or at VCH. So uh, you can reach me at either one of those. And so I'm happy to take any further questions. We're just coming up to our time. Or can we switch up to video conference up there so we can see all our rooms? We still have all our video conference rooms. So we do have a question here. There's a number of them, so I have to keep going up. But when they type, um, it kind of jumps around. So um, <laughs> Selena's saying, I have a nine-year-old who loves to eat, and sometimes I believe she was eating too much, uh, meaning her portions are bigger than an adult. Sometimes she wants more than two servings. How do I help her feel content with a, a healthy portion size instead of overeating? So I would really encourage uh, all parents to focus on their choices of food. Uh, children will often eat foods that are very sweet or are very um, tasty, right? But it's critically important to let kids eat the amount that they want to eat from the foods you've chosen. And so kids are good you know it's like I said about breastfeeding mm -hmm. is we let kids eat the right amount when they're breastfeeding and they don't lose that ability and so what we have to make sure is that we're offering them a variety of healthy foods including a few higher calorie low nutrition foods like lemon bran low for triple ginger cookies right that we want to include those as part right a lot of people ask about things like desserts 
And Satter's advice, Ellen Satter's advice, is that we include desserts as part of everything we serve. So here's your chicken, here's your peas, here's your potatoes, here's your chocolate pudding, right? The kids will probably eat the chocolate pudding first, the first time you do that. But after a while, they'll realize that there's all kinds of food and they like more than just chocolate pudding. Mm -hmm. These and are very good and very sweet. They have that sweetness <laughs> to it. I actually stuck my hand up there and took <laughs> <laughs> And so by including things like dessert, what you avoid is the valuing of some foods over than other foods, right? Oh, you have to clean your plate and then you can have dessert, right? So you have to get over all these hurdle foods to get to the good food, right? <laughs> and so I really encourage parents to offer everything Hello? all at once and let kids Hello? decide. Hello. Hello. Hello, this is Darlene Watts from Jishad. I was wondering what happened to the Aboriginal content of this, this, this program. The other thing I was wondering about was the uh, the young mothers and the reduced stress levels in prepare, uh, during pregnancy and after births. The other was the effects of women that leave the hospital early. These are just uh, that leave the ho hospital early after birth, meaning either the sa they leave the same day or they leave the day after. Um, what about the women? Uh, let's see our. Oh, what about the women that are under high stress, that can't breastfeed? What support systems in, are in place um, uh, to, to support them? Infant feeding timelines. I, I really like the infant feeding timelines game that you had. I just wanted to make those comments. Okay. Uh, can we repeat the questions sort of one at a time and go through them? Darlene, are you still there? I'm here. Okay. Hello? Uh, Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> now we can hear you, yes. Okay, good. Okay, no, no, good. Have so lack, I can... of Aboriginal, lack of Aboriginal content. I'm ter in, terms, I, in terms of that, I'm talking about the traditional foods and things that, we, that uh, Aboriginal uh, women consume and what they can consume, what they can't consume and what would be better for their health? That's question one. Okay, so uh, the first, in answer to that, I would uh, encourage Aboriginal women and all women to include traditional foods in their diet. I can't think of any traditional foods that women shouldn't eat, save for traditional foods where there are issues of food safety. So examples might be things like raw oysters or eating raw fish, uh, again, within the constraints that I mentioned. And the mother risk resource outlines some of the ways that people can eat those less safe foods. But aside from that, uh, I didn't go into a lot of detail because of the diversity of traditional foods across the province, but I, I completely echo your comment that I think it's critically important for women to include traditional foods in their diet. The deer, the wildlife that we, that we eat, that mm -hmm. we consume, because women are, can't consume that during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. because that means okay. So there's yeah. some, some comments that we're hearing around uh, wildlife, <laughs> and there's excellent resource online uh, Again, I can send you links to it. I didn't include it in my presentation today, but the link would be to the, uh, there was an excellent study of environmental contaminants in traditional foods here in British Columbia. And what it showed was that there's not a lot of cause for concern around environmental contaminants. Um, that said, there was also the point brought up about radioactivity in fish that I'd like to acknowledge. But if you email me, I can certainly send you the link to that report that was done on environmental contaminants in foods. What's his email? My email is uh, jerry.caston at fnha.ca. What? Jerry. 
Jerry dot Kasten, K A S T E N, at F N H A dot C A. And that's included uh, as one of the last slides in the slideshow. All right, thank you. And there was a couple other questions. Do you still have some questions, um, Darlene? Darlene? Yes. I'm. Uh, hello. Hello. Can you Go hear ahead. me? Can you hear? Can you hear me? Uh, sure the can. next question was. The next question was, uh, how do you? How do uh, young mothers reduce stress during pregnancy and after births? So I don't have a lot of guidance to that because uh, it's not a nutrition-related question. I understand your concerns around stress's impact on breastfeeding, uh, but aside from some standard responses around um, guided breathing exercises and calmness, and the other comment that I generally Results. offer around stress is for people to try to get into green spaces at least once a day. But stress isn't my area of expertise as a nutritionist, so I'm sort of cautious about providing a lot of guidance. I think you're muted again, Darlene. Trying to see if we've lost some of the other. Hello? Hello, we can hear you now. Lost some rooms. Okay, you had another question, Darlene. We can't hear you. There we go. Hello? Hello. Okay. The, what, the other question was um, I, it was not a question. But I think when you were talking about nutrition, I think that it's wise to be able to, to let the young mother know that they, you know, not to consume high sugar, have a high sugar diet or salt in their diet, which causes, which causes a lot of uh, nervousness, which creates stress. And yeah, it's, I agree. Uh, it's, so that is part of the nutri that is a part of nutrition. That's all yeah, I wanted I think to say with that one. Yeah, I, I agree that high sugar foods, particularly sugar sweetened beverages, are things that women might want to consider reducing or eliminating their intake of while they're pregnant. Uh, certainly with the prevalence of gestational diabetes amongst First Nations communities, I think elimination of sugar sweetened beverages is well advised. Uh, certainly your comments about high salt foods are also well advised. The other question that I had was with regards to the liquid solids, liquids and separating liquids and solids. Yeah, and that's specific to heartburn. Okay. The reason I'm asking this, this question is because I was thinking about uh, the, the, uh, the solids. Young moms, yes. I don't know, uh, still um, continue to give solids to babies, but they chew it themselves before they give it to the child. Yes. And uh, our, our and do prepare to give them liquids like water uh, during the time of feeding to assist them in terms of digestion. So I just wondered about that, you know, in, uh, in terms of the introduction to solids. Some babies are introduced at three months. Yeah. So I would encourage parents to defer introduction until you know around six months. So that's, you know, it doesn't have to be 187.5 days, but absolutely, it, uh, the deferring until around six months uh, means that you aren't displacing more nutritious foods like breast milk or infant formula with foods that baby can't digest very well and will mostly just pass through them. So there's no uh, information out there that shows any benefit to feeding foods before six months. And there is a lot of information that shows problems that can arise. Uh, as for 
moms chewing food before they give it to their babies, I'm pretty comfortable with that. And then um, about separating solids and liquids, there's no actual need for water during the first year. That breast milk has enough free water in it and formula also has enough free water. But that said, it's often very handy to use as a way to teach babies to drink out of a lidless cup. That they learn how to hold a cup, how to bring a cup to their mouth, and how to form their lips around a cup by drinking water. And when they spill it on themselves, it's not a big issue. So water can be good as a training device, but breast milk and formula are still the best liquids for infants to drink. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Is there any more questions on the video conference? Quick. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions on the Adobe Connect. Well, Jerry, thank you very much for joining us today. Actually, everything smells really good in our room right now. But what I'm going to say is um, what I did take from today's session was that there is probably a need. I actually wrote this down earlier in your presentation. Maybe, you know, a session on breastfe breastfeeding and the lactation circle and maybe moving into, um, you know, um, pieces about what we're doing to support our young mothers in the rental health, right? Because that is an area that I'm exploring with the Indian Residential Survivor Society and um, with Carol Patrick right mm -hmm. now over at the FNHA. We're putting developmental pieces together, so maybe that's an offshoot of this presentation. That would be fantastic, because yes. I run into that around, particularly around issues of division of responsibility, mm -hmm. right? Because the residential schools brought a number of practices into being around clean your plate, children being force-fed, mm -hmm. food being withheld, right. that have big impacts across the generations. Yes, yes. So, yeah, so we will look in that direction. And I see we're probably losing our rooms here because we're in afternoon and people are departing for, for lunch. But all I'm going to say is make sure you fall, have a look at our website and look for the upcoming sessions, learningcircle.ubc.ca. Follow us on Twitter and join us on Facebook. But thank you very much for joining us today from beautiful downtown Vancouver. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Thanks again, Terry. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. There you go, Jerry. I forgot to give you.